how can you start making steps towards improving metabolic dysfunction? Well, first we have to know what metabolic dysfunction really is because I think there's a lot of kind of blanket statements about it and people just automatically chalk it up to obesity and type two diabetes and all these things kind of wrapped together. In a lot of ways, that is it. But I really like to get granular and get to a molecular level. So we're gonna jump right in. I'm just gonna save you a bunch of time. We're gonna jump right into what I think the first thing that you can do to improve metabolic dysfunction is. And that is be in a deficit. Whether it be through fasting, whether it be through caloric restriction, whether it be through time-restricted feeding by reducing your caloric window by, you know, into 12-hour periods, whatever. But here's the reason. I'm not just going to say that. There's a lot of people on the internet that'll say, eat in a deficit. It's going to solve all your problems. Eat in a deficit. You're going to lose weight. It's not about counting the calories, okay? Because we don't know necessarily how many calories we need in a specific day, right? That's why I'm a bigger fan of just fasting because you know you're in a deficit rather than trying to count every single granular calorie to hope you're in a deficit. It's almost better to just say, hey, today I'm going to fast. I know I'll be in a deficit. End of story, right? But anyway, let's move on from that. The reason that this is so important and at the root of so much of metabolic dysfunction is because mitochondrial dysfunction is the most important thing. Okay, now the reason I say that is, first of all, I look at the biochemistry, but secondly, the Institute of Biotechnology at the University of Helsinki had even said they believed that mitochondrial dysfunction is at the root of so many disease states, many, if not possibly all disease states that we look at metabolically. So what does that mean in simple essence? Well, mitochondrial dysfunction is where the energy powerhouse within your cell is not working properly. It's so dysfunctional that it two things get disrupted. One, it doesn't produce energy very well anymore. Okay, now the way that a mitochondria produces energy in a very simple sense is it takes electrons that are extracted from the food that we eat and it passes them through what's called a proton gradient. So basically, they drop down a bunch of like floors on a building, so to speak, and each time it drops, it creates energy, and it drops again and creates energy. And I'm getting kind of complicated, but the electron transport chain is kind of weird. Okay, when a mitochondrial is dysfunctional, when that electron is going through its various stages, it gets disrupted and sometimes bounces out of control. When it bounces out of control, it creates what's called mitochondrial reactive oxygen species. It's like if you had an exhaust leak in your engine compartment. It would be like all that exhaust that would normally be controlled is now like expanding out through your hood, right? And you're hearing that loud noise and it's messy and it's dirty and whatever, right? Or an oil leak, right? It's just a leak. So you're essentially having a leak for lack of a better term. This can trigger metabolic damage because now you have literal oxidative stress that your body has to deal with. This can contribute to the effects of aging. It can contribute to uh, the immune system being overactive. It can contribute to an inflammatory response. A whole cascade of different things that we don't need to go into right now. So my point in saying this is that not only are you producing energy less efficiently, but you're also producing more stressors, oxidative stressors. So what does being in a deficit have to do with this? Well, a lot of people in the scientific community tend to agree that mitochondrial dysfunction happens as a result of being bombarded with nutrients. That's why it tends to happen later in life for a lot of people after they've already had years of high glucose or years of just being overweight or years of hyperlipidemia. So much energy sensing, like so much nutrients that the cells are overwhelmed. Putting yourself in a deficit via fasting, via ketogenic diet, via just caloric restriction in general, can be hugely beneficial because it deacetylases something called PGC1A. This is a gene that has to do with mitochondrial biogenesis. When we encode for PGC1A, we allow mitochondria to be formed. So let's say we have old decrepit mitochondria that do a crappy job, but now we have new, shiny new mitochondria that do a great job. Well, putting ourselves in a deficit allows this to happen. It has to do with the phosphorylation of AMPK. So when we phosphorylate AMPK by putting ourselves in a deficit, again, complicated gobbledygook that I don't need to worry about right now, but when we phosphorylate AMPK, it puts us in a deficit and the body says, uh-oh, well, this person's like in a deficit, 
So we need to get them very efficient at using fuel. So old cruddy mitochondria start to get you know, gobbled up and torn away, and new mitochondria that are more efficient get better. You have more mitochondrial mass. Another thing that plays a role with this is what is called the NAD to NADH ratio. Okay, so this is the ratio of NAD that normally carries an electron. So NAD would carry an electron into the mitochondria to be used for fuel. NAD is a great thing. Without it, we would be dead in like 15 to 30 seconds. Absolutely imperative for cellular function. But it has two jobs, possibly more. One job is to carry electrons into the mitochondria. Another job is to go activate other things when it's not busy. So it's kind of like a fighter pilot that the fighter pilot's main job, important job, is to be a fighter pilot. But when he's not flying, he also works at the desks and works a desk job. I know this because I come from a military family. That's how it works, okay? So with the NAD, when it's not transporting nutrients, it is activating something called sirtuins, specifically like SIRT1. So these sirtuins can actually influence mitochondrial biogenesis. They influence mitochondrial physiology. They influence PGC1A. They also influence FOXO3, which has to do with the ability to neutralize those oxidative stressors, right? Very, very important. So if we're constantly bombarding our bodies with fuel, then that NAD is also with NADH, means the uh, increase in NAD to the NADH ratio. So to put it in anecdotal context, that fighter pilot is always going to war. He's always flying his plane. So he's never getting a chance to actually do the desk work that he still needs to get done for everyone to get paid and everyone to do things, right? The important work that still needs to get done. So if we put ourselves in a deficit now and then, then the NAD can go do its job activating sirtuins as well. Um, one of the things that you can do to help support this process, they're a sponsor of this channel, is take something called NMN. Now, NMN isn't officially on this list. It's a subset of the energy deficit piece. So NMN stands for nicotinamide mononucleotide, and it is indirectly sort of a precursor to NAD. So we could potentially influence our levels of NAD by supporting NMN levels. So NMN and nicotinamide riboside are things that Dr. David Sinclair talks about a lot. So as far as metabolic dysfunction, it is something that I absolutely keep in my toolbox. They are a completely different kind of NMN than what you'll normally see. They keep their product cold storage, they do it like they're supposed to, so it's not exposed to high heat, not exposed to sunlight, and then when you get it, you wanna put it in the fridge, okay? This protects the NMN, but it also protects what's called transresveratrol, which is bound to the NMN. So very, very important with this. So to make sure you try them out after this video, definitely a tool in your toolbox. The next one is exercise, which I know you're thinking, okay, this is boring. You're giving me basic stuff. No, but trust me, exercise is going to elicit a very powerful mitophagy response, okay? Through adaptation, basically the body says, oh, this person's like demanding a lot of work from me. So I need to get more efficient. So I'm gonna make the mitochondria stronger. So I'm gonna deacetylate PGC1A and create more mitochondria. That's why endurance athletes end up having like more mitochondrial mass because they have more mitochondria to process fuel for long periods of time. So two to three times per week, do zone two or zone three cardio at like 65% of your max heart rate for 45, maybe even 60 minutes. Longer duration exercise does play a role when it comes to metabolic dysfunction. The next one is supplementing with carnitine. People look at me and they say, oh, Thomas, I don't like that you talk about supplements and this and that. You know what? Sometimes it's the way that things go. And this does not mean that you have to take this. Do I take every single thing I talk about? No, because I am a resource for people. But carnitine is heavily documented. And the research surrounding mitochondrial dysfunction is pretty cool. What it can do is it can help remove toxic acyl coenzyme A metabolites. Okay, this means that it can help remove some of the toxic metabolites within the mitochondria that make the mitochondria function poorly. Essentially, it's helping prevent the buildup of toxic compounds, but it can also help reduce some of the fatty acid associated like lipid damage that can occur. So basically, fatty acids that are inside our mitochondria that get in there because of you know, being used for fuel, well, they can oxidize. Okay, and when they oxidize, they damage the membrane of our mitochondria. When the membrane of the mitochondria is damaged, 
it's harder for nutrients to pass through, it's harder for GLUT5, it's harder for GLUT1, it's harder for all these transporters to go translocate to the surface because the mitochondrial membrane is damaged because the fatty acids are literally oxidized. So carnitine can help shuttle those fatty acids out because what carnitine is, is a fatty acid transporter. It helps fats come in, but it can also help bad fats that are oxidized get out. So with this, I would say one to 2,000 milligrams of carnitine a couple times per week could probably help you do the trick, but also can potentially aid in fat loss. So if you're exercising a lot, it doesn't hurt to take it all the time before your workouts. The next one is increasing glutathione levels, but I don't recommend you go out and just buy glutathione supplements. I don't think that that's a good route to go because I'm not a fan of providing an exogenous supplement for something you can produce naturally. So what I recommend you eat is sulfur containing foods. We're mainly looking for the amino acids like methionine. So you're gonna find that in sulfur containing foods like poultry, in eggs, in fish, in beef, higher quantities in fish and beef for sure, okay? But also specific sulfur rich vegetables. So broccoli, cauliflower, Brussels sprouts, Kind of funny, the ones that if you eat too many of make your gas smell like, well, sulfur, right? The sulfur containing vegetables work so well because glutathione requires sulfur to form. So it goes into a reduced form, it's a complicated circle, but essentially sulfur allows it to come back into its full form before it kind of goes through its whole reduction pathway to neutralize free radicals. The more that you could increase your natural glutathione levels, the more that you can potentially improve your ability to scavenge the mitochondrial reactive oxygen species that dysfunctional mitochondria and metabolic dysfunction is creating. The next one is coenzyme Q10. This is a supplement that I recommend that people over 40 take. Okay, it's been on my videos where I talk about supplements for people over 40. It's a good supplement in general. And I know you might be thinking, I don't wanna pop a bunch of pills. Okay, you don't have to. Take it for what it's worth. Take little bits and pieces. Coenzyme Q10 acts like a catcher's mitt. Remember that electron transport chain I was talking about, how the electrons go boom, 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 down these different gradients, down these different steps, okay, these different stages? Well, coenzyme Q10 acts like sort of a catcher's mitt. So it makes the catcher's mitt bigger. So when the electron drops, it has a bigger net to drop into. So that means less risk of it bouncing out of control and becoming a rogue electron which is a reactive oxygen species or an oxidative stressor. We don't want rogue electrons. We want them to drop in, ca in the proper cascade to create the proper gradient of energy. But if they go crazy, that's a bad thing. So coenzyme Q10 provides a bigger catcher's mitt for that. Then we have simple magnesium. Now magnesium, I don't care who you are, I think this is one of the top supplements that people should be taking because we cannot get good amounts from food anymore. We have depleted soil, it's difficult to get the amount of magnesium we need these days because if you wanted to get a daily allotment of magnesium, you'd be eating like 7,000 calories worth of almonds. It's just not gonna fly, especially if you're following the other rules that I'm talking about. So I would usually recommend like four or 500 milligrams per day, generally in a malate form, like a dimagnesium malate, or maybe a three and eight, or maybe a glycinate if you need help sleeping. Simple reason here is magnesium is required for ATP formation within the mitochondria. Okay, it is a cofactor for a lot of different catalyzes in biosynthesis of things. So we need it to, for the mitochondria to process ATP from our fuel. So one of the problems with mitochondrial dysfunction is we don't produce fuel efficiently. And if we have a lack or an absence of, my, of magnesium, then it makes it harder and harder to produce energy from fuel into ATP. So again, lots of different reasons there with magnesium, but it's really coming back down to the same kinds of things. So energy deficit, okay, the occasional fasting or lower carb ketogenic protocol, possibly some NMN to help with that NAD situation two to three times per week doing 45 to 60 minutes of zone two to zone three cardio. Okay. Then we have carnitine whenever you can, one to 2000 milligrams pre-workout is helpful. Okay. Sulfur containing foods, coenzyme Q10 and magnesium. As always, keep it locked in here on my channel. I'll see you tomorrow.